In my last video I explained the saturation effect for light absorptions. In this context I mentioned Heinz Huck's 1998 publication in the journal, Chemisch Rundschau. He measured the extinction coefficient of CO2 in air. Based on these measurements, he concluded that due to the saturation of the 15 micrometer CO2 absorption, a further increase of the atmospheric CO2 concentration will have practically no influence on the Earth's surface temperature. According to his results only about 0.17% of the CO2 absorption are not yet saturated at an atmospheric CO2 concentration of about 400 ppmv. In view of these facts, even true believers in the greenhouse effect should abandon the CO2-caused climate change theory. When we assume there is a greenhouse effect that somehow causes a total back radiation of 324 watt per square meter, and that CO2 makes for about 32 watt per square meter of that total, then the CO2 back radiation can increase by not more than approximately 0.05 watt per square meter before total saturation of this absorption is reached, no matter how high the atmospheric CO2 concentration goes. These additional 0.05 watt per square meter cannot cause more than 0.01 degrees centigrade of additional surface warming. This is the absolute limit for the CO2 warming effect, no matter how high the CO2 concentration rises. Hug comes to the following conclusion, that with the background of his data, should have finished the CO2 discussion as early as 1998. That atmospheric thermal radiation is given, according to Planck's law, is self-evident. However, as long as an atmospheric temperature profile, colder at the top, warmer at the bottom exists, and convection contributes significantly to the transport of energy, the hypothesis that in an open atmospheric system the energy of an IR radiation absorbed near the ground is passed on from the bottom to the top by means of radiation transport is wrong. There is no law of conservation of radiation energy. Rather, excited greenhouse gas molecules near the ground essentially transfer their energy to the non-IR active main components of the atmosphere, namely nitrogen and oxygen. This publication was written by chemist for a chemistry journal in the late 90s. Now I will try to explain all the stuff that was back then seen as self-evident. CO2 is a rod-shaped molecule, in which a carbon atom is bonded to two oxygen atoms. To understand the vibrational behavior of CO2, the bonds between the atoms can be thought of as similar to spiral springs. The elastic properties of the bonds allow the molecule to perform bending vibrations and stretching vibrations. Stretching vibrations are also called valence vibrations. Of all the possible vibrational modes of CO2, the bending vibration and the asymmetric valence vibration can be excited by infrared light. For the climate discussion only the bending vibration at wave number 666 is deemed to be relevant. Wave number 666 is equivalent to a wavelength of about 15 micrometer. When a CO2 molecule is hit by a photon with a wavelength of 15 micrometer, it can absorb the energy of this photon. In doing so, it passes from its ground state, in which it does not oscillate, to a state of higher energy, a so-called excited state, in which it performs the bending oscillation. In this excited state, the CO2 molecule stores the energy of the absorbed photon, in the form of vibrational energy. This excited state is stable for a period of time. When the CO2 molecule returns to its ground state, it emits a photon again, and stops oscillating. The emission of the photon occurs randomly in any spatial direction. Only the ground state, that means the not vibrating CO2 molecule, can absorb the 15 micrometer radiation. Similar to the radioactive decay of unstable atomic nuclei, it is not the case that the excited state has a specific lifetime. The transition from the excited state to the ground state is random. This means that if you observe a single excited state, you cannot predict whether it will radiate immediately, or continue to oscillate for a few seconds. Only if you observe a large number of excited states, you will recognize a regularity in the decay rate of the excited states. A decay law can be formulated for the excited states. With the decay constat from the HITRAM database, the half-life time of the excited state can be calculated to be about half a second. In the context of gas molecules that move around with the speed of sound, this transition from the excited state into the ground state is a very slow process. 
This diagram shows the wave number 666 absorption band in high resolution. To the left and right of the big 666 absorption, we can see several small absorptions that result from the fact that the bending vibration of the CO2 molecule is superimposed by rotational movements of the CO2 molecule. These are the so-called rotational bands. This diagram is a superposition of three spectra. All three samples contain the same amount of CO2 in the beam path. The one with the lowest absorption is pure CO2. The one with the highest absorption is CO2 in mixture with nitrogen. Halfway between the pure CO2 and the CO2 in nitrogen, we can see the absorption of the CO2 in mixture with helium. It is a well-known effect. That CO2 in mixture with not IR active gases absorbs much stronger than pure CO2. But why? Since only CO2 in its ground state can absorb 15 micrometer radiation, the low absorption of the pure CO2 sample must be caused by a low proportion of ground states in the pure CO2 sample. The low proportion of the ground states in the pure CO2 sample is caused by the long lifespan of the excited states and the permanent bombardment with 15 micrometer photons. Since all three samples are exposed to the same stream of 15 micrometer photons, we must conclude that the presence of the other gases increases the proportion of ground states in the mixed samples. That means the not IR active gases, nitrogen and helium, somehow help the excited states of the CO2 molecules to return back to their ground states more quickly, and thus increase the proportion of the ground states. This process is called thermalization or quenching of excited states. If a CO2 molecule in its excited state collides with a gas molecule, its vibrational energy can be transferred to the colliding gas molecule. After this collision, the CO2 molecule has returned to its ground state. It now can absorb a suitable photon again. The molecule that collided with the excited CO2 converts the energy transferred to it into kinetic energy. This means that the gas molecule involved in the collision with the excited CO2 molecule picks up speed in the process. Thermal radiation is thus converted into molecular movement, that means heat. At ambient temperature and pressure, air molecules experience about 7 times 10 to the 9th power collisions per second. That means the thermalization is by orders of magnitude faster than the emission from the excited state, which has a half lifetime of about half a second. Because CO2 is a popular laser medium, this quenching process has been studied very thoroughly. To get a more realistic idea about how quick this process is, we use quenching rates, published by Siddles, Wilson and Simpson, to calculate the number of non-radiative deactivations per CO2 molecule and second, in air at atmospheric pressure in 295 Kelvin. It turns out that in average, a CO2 molecule experiences approximately 100,000 non-radiative deactivations per second. Now we will compare this rate of non-radiative deactivation of the excited state of the CO2 bending vibration with the rate of the emission from the excited state of the CO2 bending vibration. From the half lifetime of the excited state of the CO2 bending vibration, of 0.45 seconds, we calculate the average lifespan of the excited state to be about 0.65 seconds. If we are generous, that results in a rate of about 2 emissions per CO2 molecule in second. That means that in air, under ambient conditions, the thermalization rate is by a factor of about 50,000 higher than the emission rate of the excited state. As a result of this rough calculation we can say that at atmospheric pressure and ambient temperature, the thermalization of the excited state of the CO2 bending vibration is by 4 to 5 orders of magnitude faster than the emission from this excited state. Even if an excited state somehow escapes the thermalization and emits a 15 micrometer photon, this photon will be absorbed after traveling a few meters through the atmosphere by another CO2 molecule. It is highly probable that the excited state resulting from this lucky escape, will then be thermalized. Under these conditions a radiative transport of energy through the lower layers of the atmosphere by a cascade of emission and absorption events is not possible. Therefore a noteworthy back radiation or greenhouse effect is in the lower atmosphere not possible. Now it is understandable why CO2 absorbs more strongly when mixed with other gases than in its pure form. In pure CO2, 
A CO2 molecule in the excited state can only transfer its energy to another CO2 molecule, which in turn, then enters the excited state. In total, the proportion of CO2 molecules in the ground state does not increase via such an energy transfer. In gas mixtures, CO2 molecules, after they have absorbed IR radiation and are in an excited state, transfer their vibrational energy to other gas molecules. In addition to the emission of IR radiation, this energy transfer to other gas molecules opens up an alternative, very fast way for the CO2 molecules to return to the ground state. Therefore, the proportion of CO2 molecules in the ground state is greater in gas mixtures than in pure CO2. Accordingly, a stronger CO2 absorption is observed in gas mixtures than in pure CO2. As we have seen so far, thermalization results in a very efficient and quick conversion of radiation energy into thermal energy. In gases or gas mixtures that contain infrared active gases, the opposite process is also possible. This process is called thermally excited emission. It converts the thermal energy of gases, that means the kinetic energy of gas molecules, into infrared radiation. In a collision with another gas molecule, a CO2 molecule, in the ground state, can absorb sufficient energy from the kinetic energy of its collision partner, that it goes into an excited state. It can then emit a photon, and return to its ground state. In this process, kinetic energy from the gas molecule, that collided with the CO2 molecule, is converted into thermal radiation. The gas cools down in this process, since it loses thermal energy via infrared radiation. The kinetic energy of gas molecules follows the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. Therefore, the proportion of gas molecules, whose kinetic energy is greater than the excitation energy EI, can be calculated. Even at low temperatures, like minus 53 degrees Celsius, still about 1.3% of the gas molecules have sufficient kinetic energy to excite the CO2 bending vibration. Now we will see how the processes, discussed before influence the heat transport from the Earth's surface through the atmosphere. By the range of 8 to 13 micrometers, infrared radiation, emitted by the Earth's surface, can escape almost unhindered through the so-called atmospheric windows. The thermal radiation that is absorbed in the lower atmosphere by greenhouse gas molecules is thermalized due to the frequent collisions with other gas molecules under the high pressure of the lower atmosphere. The heat liberated in this process joins the heat transferred into the air via direct collisions of air molecules with the Earth's surface and initiates convection flows. These convection flows transport the heat up to the boundary layer of the troposphere. Under the low pressure of the high altitudes, thermally excited emission becomes the dominant process, since collisions between gas molecules become less frequent. In the upper atmosphere, the thermally excited emission converts the convectively transported heat energy into infrared radiation that can escape into space. As discussed before a back radiation from the upper atmosphere down to the Earth's surface is not possible, since thermalization in the dense lower atmosphere acts as a kind of check valve. Or in short, in the lower atmosphere greenhouse gases convert infrared radiation into heat that joins the thermal convection. In the upper atmosphere, they convert the heat in infrared radiation and thus contribute to a cooling of the upper atmosphere. I hope that what Heinz Hug took for granted back in 1998 has now been explained in a reasonably comprehensible way. In Tom Nelson's podcast number 98, Tom Shula told us how he came to a very similar conclusion based on his work with vacuum measuring devices. Now let's see how well Huggs and Shula's theories fit to real-world satellite measurement of the Earth's thermal radiation into space. These graphs show infrared spectra of the Earth's emission into space. Spectrum A was measured over the desert Sahara, B over the Mediterranean Sea, and C over the Antarctic region. The dashed curves each show the radiation of a black body with the temperature indicated in the curve. That means that if in spectrum B the Earth had no atmosphere or an atmosphere without greenhouse gases, the satellite would measure the dashed curve for 280 Kelvin. The solid zigzag line in spectrum B shows the infrared radiation measured over the Mediterranean. In this spectrum, the so-called atmospheric window can be seen very clearly. 
In the range from 8 to 14 micrometer, the atmosphere is practically completely permeable to IR radiation. Only the ozone layer absorbs in this range. The radiation here follows a blackbody radiation that corresponds to the temperature of the radiating Earth's surface. In spectrum B, this would correspond to a temperature of the Mediterranean Sea of 7 to 10 degrees Celsius. In spectra A and B, a very clear CO2 absorption can be seen. The really interesting thing about this band is that it shows a CO2 emission band in its center at 15 micrometer. The base of this emission band lies on the 220 Kelvin line of the blackbody radiation. This observation fits well to a lower atmosphere that is not permeable for the 15 micrometer radiation and a thermally excited emission at high altitudes at a temperature of about 220 Kelvin. As we calculated before even at this low temperature about 1.3% of the air molecules have sufficient thermal energy to excite the bending vibration of CO2. Spectrum C was recorded over Antarctica. Here the Earth's surface is significantly colder than the upper part of the troposphere. Therefore, no CO2 absorption band is visible. But if you look closely, you can see CO2 in emission. This is a situation that should not exist if the radiative transfer equation were to describe reality. As a result we can state that at least for the CO2, the satellite measurements fit quite well to Hugg's theory. The immediate thermalization of the excited states in the lower atmosphere also explains why it is so difficult to really measure the postulated 324 watt per square meter of back radiation. Furthermore, the often close to linear temperature gradient of the troposphere indicates that cooling occurs here, in accordance with the work done during the ascent of air masses.